The Path is a teaching series sponsored by World Missionary Evangelism. We hope that this series will deepen your knowledge and walk in our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's your host, John Cathcart. Well, the ministry of Paul in the city of Ephesus has had a huge negative impact on the finances of the silversmiths who made these little temples of the goddess Diana and sold them to tourists and visitors. And so Demetrius raised up the trade union and caused an uproar and people assembled and he gave a speech and it was like pouring gasoline on a fire. And the answer to the speech of Demetrius was a unanimous shout of the watchword of Ephesus, which was, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Well, so large a meeting of the workmen created much excitement, and crowds came flocking from every portico, the agora, the gymnasium, and the street. And the whole city was thrown into a state of riot, and a rush was made for the Jewish quarter and the shop of Aquila. Well, what took place, we're not exactly told, except that the life of the apostle was in the most extreme danger. The mob, however, was balked of its intended prey. Paul, as in similar peril at Thessalonica, was either not at the home of Aquila at the time or had been successfully concealed by Priscilla and her husband Aquila, who themselves ran great risk of being killed in their efforts to protect him. And you can consult Romans, the Epistle to the Romans, chapter 16 and verse 4 regarding this matter. But Paul's friends better appreciated the magnitude of the danger. Now Gaius and Aristarchus were too subordinate to be made scapegoats for the vengeance of the crowd, but they were sure that the mere appearance of that bent figure and worn and wasted face which had become so familiar to many of the cities of Asia, would be the instant signal for a terrible outbreak. And their opposition was confirmed by a friendly message from one of the Asiarchs, a political official, Philip of Smyrna, who rightly conjectured the uh, civilist impulse that would lead the apostle to confront the storm. He figured out that Paul would try to confront this. Well, anxious to prevent bloodshed and save the life of one whose gifts and greatness they had learned to admire, and well aware of the excitability of an Ephesian mob, they sent Paul an express warning not to trust himself in the theatre. Well, the riot therefore spent itself in idle noise. And for two hours, as though they had been howling dervishes, this mongrel Greek crowd continued their senseless yell incessantly, great as Diana of the Ephesians. Well, by that time, they were sufficiently exhausted to render it possible for a political leader to get a hearing. Well, hitherto, the authorities, afraid that these proceedings might end in awakening Roman jealousy, to a serious curtailment of their privileges, had vainly endeavored to storm the torrent of excitement. Romans didn't put up with any mob nonsense. They sent out the troops and took care of it real quick. But now availing himself of a momentary lull, the record of the city, either mock officer at the time, who was chosen by the Senate and the people of of the city, or probably the permanent city official, succeeded in restoring order. Now the proconsul, the Roman proconsul of Asia was practically autocratic and only restrained by the dread of being ultimately brought to law in Rome. And subject to his authority, the chief cities of Asia were autonomous managing their affairs by the decision of a council. They were kind of like the dog on the rope. They had all the liberty in the world until they got to the end of the rope. Well, the recorder acted as the speaker 
and he held a very important position. And it may have been all the more easy for him because one who was capable of making so admirably skillful and sensible a speech could hardly have failed to win a permanent respect which enhanced the dignity of his position. <coughs> well, the speech is a classic. Ephesians, he exclaimed, what human being is there who is unaware that the city of Ephesus is the sacristan of the great Artemis and the heaven fallen image since then? This is quite indisputable. Your duty is to maintain your usual calm and not to act in the precipitate way in which you have acted by dragging these men here who are neither temple robbers nor blasphemers of your goddess. Now he gets political and he says, if Demetrius and his fellow artisans have any complaint to lodge against anyone, the sessions, that is the, the legal hearing sessions are going on and there are proconsuls, let them settle the matter between them at law. But if you are making any further inquisition about other matters, Something else behind this, he says, it shall be disposed of in the regular meeting of the assembly. For indeed, this business renders us liable to a charge of sedition, since we shall be entirely unable to give any reasonable account of this mass meeting. Now, this is a super clever speech. First of all, he assures them that no one is unaware that Ephesus is a city of the great goddess. And then he tells them that um, basically if there are any, if they have any complaints, they can be settled at law in the courts. And then he points out to them, and if you keep up this riot, the Romans are gonna come and deal with you very harshly. And also as a city, we are likely to lose all our liberties. Well, the effect of his speech was instantaneous. And the scripture puts it so succinctly, and Luke does. He called across the tumult, and the tumult fell. World Missionary Evangelism has been taking care of children. It started with just a few little orphans in India and has grown to touch thousands over the last five decades. But what does child sponsorship mean? Well, child sponsorship means that someone just like you is providing food, clothing, medical care, an education, and in many cases, a home in which to live. Imagine for a second growing up on the streets. Imagine for a second being all alone at the age of four or five. Imagine what it's like just to survive. Those we don't help often die. Some are sold into slavery, a problem that still exists in the world today. Yet through child sponsorship, there's a bridge built, a bridge from nightmares to dreams, an opportunity for that child who had no future now to be blessed with a future that lifts others up as you lifted him up. Child sponsorship is a very important part of World Missionary Evangelism's work. It's such an important part that it's really the heart of our mission, reaching out, saving lives. There are so many children right now who need to be sponsored. And if you were to step forward and take one of them under your care, you would have the knowledge in your heart and in your soul that this child felt Christ's love through your donations and gifts. Why don't you pray about and think about sponsoring a child today? of Paul has caused an uproar in the city of Ephesus at a time when all the area round about, in fact, emissaries from far away had come to the city. 
And uh, the leader of the city, the chief politician, let's put it that way, gave an extremely clever speech and the tumult stopped because the citizens realized if we keep this up, the Romans are going to come and deal with us in a very powerful fashion. I mean, the Romans would not hesitate to slaughter a mob. Never bothered them at all. But what did bother them, what bothered the people of Ephesus, was the potential loss of their independence. However, it's not likely that the danger to St. Paul's person ceased in a month of which he had spoiled the festivity, and in a city which was as thronged as it was with a grieved interest and outraged superstition. Now, whether Paul was thrown in prison or what the dangers were to which he alludes in his writings, and in what way, as he puts it, God delivered him from, quote, so great a death we can't tell. At any rate, it became impossible for him to carry out his design uh, or his intention of staying at Ephesus until Pentecost. And all that we are further told is that when the hubbub had ceased, he called his disciples together and after comforting them, told the church farewell. Certainly for many years, perhaps forever. And Paul set out, whether by sea or land we do not know, on his way to Macedonia and then to Achaia or southern Greece. And you can find this in Acts 20 verses 1 and 2. Well now, by this time, the Jews have gotten very organized internationally in their opposition to Paul. And by this time, the Jews were lying in wait for Paul as he was about to sail for Syria. So Paul changed his plans and decided to return through northern Greece and Macedonia, Acts 20 and verse 3. Well, Paul's friends went ahead of him and waited for him at Troas. Now, Troas, or the famous city of Troy, was on the western shore of Turkey on the Aegean Sea. Well, from Troas, Paul sailed to Miletus, and then on to Assus, to Mytilene, to Chios, to Samos, to Troglium, and Miletus. Now, Paul intended to bypass Ephesus, to sail by Ephesus. Why not? I mean, he's caused an uproar, and his life is in danger. Uh, and he determines to say, sail by Ephesus, one, because of the danger, but two, in order to get to Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost. So from Miletus, he called for the elders of the church at Ephesus to come to him and testified to them, told them about his life, and said he was going, a very interesting expression, quote, bound in the spirit to Jerusalem. That's a very, very interesting statement. He was going bound in the spirit to Jerusalem. And he exhorted them and commended them to the grace of God. But we can tell by reading the book of Acts, and it plainly says it, they knew they were not going to see him again on this earth. Well, from Miletus, Paul sailed to Kos, then to Rome, or then to Rhodes and Patara. And finding a ship in Patara that was bound for Phoenicia, well, the northern part of the Holy Land, they sailed to Cyprus, then Syria, and landed at the Phoenician and commercial city, famous city of Tyre. Well, on this last visit to Jerusalem, when Paul's company landed at Tyre, they found disciples there and remained seven days. Now, during this time, Paul was instructed by the Spirit through these disciples not to go to Jerusalem. 
the Holy Spirit through these disciples at Tyre told Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. But Paul has stated he felt bound in the spirit to go to Jerusalem. Now, for me, it's hard to understand why Paul would not obey the Holy Spirit and while he, why he felt at liberty not to obey the Holy Spirit. You know, certainly it was Paul's choice. God is not going to force us to do things. He may guide us, he may direct us, he may indicate to us what we should do, but he's not going to force us to do it. Well, what happened now was as Paul goes to Jerusalem, Jews who have come, I mean, they're on top of Paul's movements, and Jews who have come from Asia Minor stirred up the people and accused Paul of bringing a Gentile into the temple. Now, Paul had not done this, but it was a good excuse. They accused Paul of bringing a Gentile into the temple. That's a big no, big no-no. Paul had not done this, but the accusation was enough and Paul was seized and dragged out of the temple and the entire city was in an uproar. Now, we tend to forget in these days and times, you know, there's been so much concern about acts against the Jewish population and they're very real, but the Jews have done their share of persecuting too. And so this is a two-edged sword. Well, the city's in an uproar. Paul has been seized. And as they were about to kill him, tearing apart, the chief captain of the Roman band came and Paul was delivered by this Roman captain and by the soldiers of the Roman captain, so temporarily safe. Just as it is in America, the key to escaping poverty is education. World Missionary Evangelism has long recognized the importance of education and has emphasized it to the children that we save via our child sponsorship programs and food for hunger programs. We have established schools and these schools provide the basic education these children need to begin to escape the poverty that has ensnared their families, often for generations. What can you do to help us educate children? In many cases, we need new schools. World Missionary Evangelism also needs books and supplies. Children have to have school uniforms in many nations just to attend schools. And of course, there's the need for things like backpacks. How can you get involved? Find out the various costs of providing a child with things like school supplies, backpacks, a desk, a school uniform, or perhaps even an education at a university or college. An education builds a bridge between hopelessness and hope. It provides a future where dreams can be realized. It also positions a child to become a leader as an adult and in that leadership role, lift his family and his country out of the bonds of poverty. You can begin right now by supporting programs at World Missionary Evangelism that emphasize education. Well, Paul has left the mission field sailed past Ephesus, gone to Tyre, which is in the Holy Land, great commercial Phoenician city. And when he gets there, he's warned by the Holy Spirit through the gifts of the Spirit that are in the believers there not to go to Jerusalem. But Paul is determined he's going to go. Now, why he disobeyed the Holy Spirit, I don't know. There was one man that came, a, a prophet, and bound his hands symbolically and said, you know, that this is what's going to happen to you if you go to Jerusalem. But 
Paul was determined to go and he went. Well, the Asian Jews are on Paul's track and they're following him and they're determined to take him out. And so when Paul gets to Jerusalem, these Asiatic Jews accuse Paul of having brought a Gentile into the temple. Now, that is a big offense and this excitable crowd believes this charge, which wasn't true by the way, but they believed it. And they seize Paul and were about to tear him apart and would have if Paul had not been rescued by a Roman officer and his soldiers. And they took Paul into custody. Well, they bound Paul with chains. We well, didn't know what he'd done, but they figured they'd better find out. But Paul asked the captain to be given permission to speak to the people. And the captain gave him permission, perhaps hoping that if Paul spoke to the people, it might calm them down. Well, what Paul did was give his testimony of conversion. And that was effective. The crowd demanded to kill him. So the captain commanded that Paul be brought into the castle and examined by scourging. In other words, they're going to beat the truth out of him. But before they started scourging him, Paul asked the centurion if it was lawful to scourge a man who was a Roman citizen, unjudged and uncondemned. And the answer to that, in case you don't know, is no. That was a major, major offense. If a man was a Roman, you didn't scourge him because some rabble crowd wanted to do so, wanted to kill him. And so this Roman officer knew, whoops, this is getting on very serious ground. And the captain loosed Paul from his bonds and commanded the chief priests and their council to show up and clarify this whole matter. Well, now Paul appears before the Jewish council and Paul does something that's very political. As he speaks, he can see that part of his audience were Pharisees and part of them were Sadducees and he played them off against one another on a doctrinal basis while identifying himself as being a Pharisee. Well, he has split the opposition and the Pharisees decided there was no fault in Paul and the captain fearing that Paul could be torn apart by the mob, which wouldn't do the captain any good, by the way. The captain commanded the soldiers to go and take Paul and bring him to the castle. Well, it was that night, as so often happened in Paul's life, that the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to him and told him that just as he had been a witness in Jerusalem, so he would be a witness in Rome. Now, the Lord didn't say, you're going to be a witness in Rome in a couple of weeks, but he said he would be a witness in Rome. Well, the Jews formed a conspiracy to take Paul by subterfuge. But a young relative of Paul's got wind of the plot and conveyed it to the captain. He said, this is what the Jewish crowd is going to try and do. And the captain decided to take Paul under heavy military guard to Caesarea, which is more of a Gentile town in the Holy Land, certainly a Roman point of authority. And they were going to bring him to Felix, the governor. And they did. Well, Felix talked to Paul and commanded him to be kept in Herod's judgment trial or judgment hall until his trial. Well, who is Felix? Well, Marcus Antonius Felix was appointed by the Emperor Claudius and he was the fourth procurator of Judea in office from 52 to 60 AD. Felix was simply as corrupt as you can get. 
He was cruel. He was open to bribery. And the fact that he was open to bribery caused a great increase in crime in Judea. And the rule of Felix was marked by internal feuds and disturbances. Now, Felix had married three times, and his second wife was of interest because she was the daughter of Herod Agrippa I. Well, the high priest and his team have been summoned, and Ananias, the high priest, went with an orator named Tertullus, because somebody's got to present the case to Felix, and accused Paul of profaning the temple at Jerusalem. Well, Felix beckoned Paul to speak, and Paul says he'd come to bring arms to his nation. But certain Jews from Asia had accused Paul. But here's where the problem occurs. Certain Jews from Asia have accused Paul, but they're nowhere to be found. And that didn't fly with Roman justice. Well, Paul said to Felix that the high priest had found no evil in him when he stood before their council, except for the fact, and now here Paul gets political again, except for the fact that Paul is a Pharisee, believed in the resurrection, and Ananias as a Sadducee did not believe in the resurrection, and Paul said he was here before Felix because of his belief in the resurrection. In other words, he has turned a judicial case into a religious case. World Missionary Evangelism began its work with seven orphan children. Today, WME is working in developing countries around the world. Every day, WME programs are changing lives by meeting basic physical needs and saving souls by reaching out to the lost with the good news of Jesus Christ. You can partner with WME in a variety of ways to help those in desperate need. To learn more about WME's mission and work, please visit us on the web at www.wme.org. If you want to become a monthly sponsor for a child or native minister, support a particular project. If you would like to mail a donation, please send it to World Missionary Evangelism, P.O. Box 660800, Dallas, Texas 75266. You can make a world of difference in a precious life by contacting WME today. Thank you for your continued prayers and support of this ministry, and may God abundantly bless you.